Are flaws the contrary of merits? What do you think? I can think of people that I find have flaws and merits at the same time. And I'm going to argue that there's weakness of strength here. That flaws are the inevitable downside of merits. The five personality dimensions. Openness, consciousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Remember that person that you thought was curious and inventive, but you found him or her to be too gossipy? Remember that person that was very energetic, but you found her to be exhausting? Or that person that was confident, but came across as too arrogant at times? But it's the same trait. So we have to be flexible to context with our personality traits. And by the way, 50% of the variability we find in personality traits comes from genetics. So how do we learn to use these traits of ours and to be flexible to context? How do we learn that some things are good or bad in given contexts? Uh, how do we adapt our merits and our flaws? Do you think it's from education, culture, parenting, schooling? Could it be all of this? What about biology? How much do you think biology has anything to do with this? And I want to show of hands. Who thinks biology has anything at all to do with adapting our merits and faults for context? Okay. Not many of you. Let's see. So let me challenge that. Let's talk about oxytocin. This is a molecule. It looks like that and exists in our brain. It circulates in our blood as well as a hormone. And it's there to help us navigate in our social world. Because we do. We have to do it all the time. When we're judging others in their flaws and merits and when we are adapting to the context, when we are being good or bad, we are using oxytocin. So we are making um, use of oxytocin to interact with each other. And um, oxytocin does this by, by making actually uh, neurons interact, as you can see. So this is neurons communicating with each other in our brains. And oxytocin is facilitating this along with other neurotransmitters. So, Oxytocin is released when we undergo social stress. When someone is mean to us, for example. When we breastfeed. When we give birth. When we receive and give caresses. When we receive and give massages. When we orgasm. <coughs> when we caress other animals. Or when we look at people deeply. When we share a meal. And even when we play some jazz improvisation within a group, we release oxytocin more than when we just play in an orchestra. So it makes us um, aware of our social environment, pay attention to people's expressions, uh, helps us judge other people's intentions and, and, and emotions. And not only us, actually. Think of these guys. These are vampire bats. And when they've sniffed, oxytocin intranasal to really tiny intranasal uh, vessels, they uh, have been more generous in the food that they share with others. So basically these guys, they suck blood out of cows and then sometimes they have too much. So instead of just throwing it out, they give it to their friends. This is the important thing. They tend to give this extra blood, this extra meal, to those that have given them blood before. Or have given them some sex before, or have given them some grooming. And if you give them extra oxytocin, they even do this in a higher quantity. They give them more blood. And I think, as far as I'm aware, that vampire bats do not go to school, do not have a specific culture, 
and um, yeah, they don't read books. So they get all this altruism just from their biology. That research was from Carter and colleagues. This research is from lots of co uh, researcher colleagues of, of mine. Um, and it also shows that it extends to other rodents. Oxytocin has increased maternal care and partner preference in rodents. So they become sort of more monogamous when they have their oxytocin system upregulated and they become better mothers. They lick their children more and they, are, they care for them better. So what about humans? So this is where I start having fun in my lab, in my neuroscience lab in the University of Lisbon, by giving this to humans and seeing what happens. And I'm going to tell you what other colleagues um, in this research area have found out so far. So um, that if you sniff this uh, basal of oxytocin, a nasal spray, you may as well give more money from a prize. So we've put people through this challenge in the lab. And, and people got more generous when they sniffed this hormone and people trusted more a return from their invested money when they sniffed this hormone, as you can see. And when they tried uh, making couples, just in get, getting together and fighting about their favorite fights, they found that once they took oxytocin versus placebo, resumed their fights quicker and used nicer words instead of nastier words. But, the Drew and colleagues also found that oxytocin reduced how, ni how nice you were with people, reduced cooperation with people from a rival group. So when they put these two groups playing a game, they found that people that had sniffed oxytocin were slightly more nasty to people in another group, but not to people in their own group. So oxytocin is not all about flowers and birds and happiness. It also makes us be nastier to rival groups in the face of threats. So when resources are limited and we are playing a game or in a really dangerous situation where we need to protect ourselves. So in summary, oxytocin means trust, altruism, protection, but it also seems to mean defense, aggression, and competition, the same molecule, the same biological system. This actually makes sense, although it seems it doesn't. Because in the face of threats, when resources are limited, aggression towards a competing outgroup, the other, the rival group, actually means altruism towards I, my, my in-group. So, because it increases my in-group's relative strength, and thus my own survival. So, so Susie says it much better than I. It's simple, you can't have an in-crowd unless you leave someone out of it. Without uncool, there is no cool. So basically, you're nothing without me. We need other groups to have our own group. We need to be aggressive with other groups to protect our own. This is in the face of threat, remember, or in the face of limited resources. So oxytocin has two faces, okay? But they are faces of the same coin, and it's weakness of strength again. Competition as the other side of cooperation. Flaws as the other side of merits. And context is everything. Because in a context where there's no limited resources, no threats, right? oxytocin's actions will not be of competition and aggression, but they will be in the context of a war or very limited resources. But what we need to understand is that actually this latter context is pretty rare these days. We are quite privileged to be uh, not needing to fight for our survival every day. So can we change our oxytocin system to become better, more ethical, more cooperative people, more generous people? Do we need to change the system? Is it even possible since it's a system that has been growing in our brains for thousands of years, millions of years? Well, so if we can't, then how can we be better? 
Well, remember that action depends on context, and context is also out of our control. But can we conceptualize context, our in-group and out-groups, in a different way? Let's see. Well, we've solved the similar dilemma with food. We've evolved to be crazy about sugar and fat. Because it was good. In our evolutionary past, the ones of us who craved for sugar and fat survived better because they were pretty, uh, um, pretty nutritious, but they were quite rare. So our system tells us to go and get them. But now, with our abundance, we know it's not the best choice, choice by the contrary. In our context right now, we needed to cognitively change the way we interpret hunger. And we know that we need to eat properly. So the same thing with how we use our oxytocin system. Um, in terms of food, the context changed. The, ones of, the food scarcity is pretty rare. It happens only in our together society now. So with oxytocin, we can think, is there a threat? Let's ask first. No. Do I need um, resources that are scarce to survive? No. Then why do I even need to conceptualize an outgroup? Actually, we can imagine our in-group growing. We can grow it. We are privileged enough at this time to do so. But our biological system has not been quick enough to catch up. Genetics takes a long time, so we have to help our most uh, ancient system of oxytocin in our brain and use our prefrontal cortex to conceptualize that we are not fighting for survival resources anymore and we can actually be more cooperative. And we can have this in-group grow in time and space. We can consider the Chinese at the other side of the world to be close to us, part of our in-group. We can consider someone that will live in a hundred years' time to be close to one, part of our family. And when we think about environmental choices, choices that can impact the environment, this is what we are doing. So I want to uh, wish you well and hope that you enjoy your upgrades of your oxytocin system so you can think of striving to have a system, an oxytocin 2.0, with these bug fixes. It turns your neurobiological flaws into merits, from, from aggression to cooperation, by updating your perception of your social context, by realizing that you're not fighting for survival anymore, and you can let your in-group grow and let your potential outgroups disappear. And welcome to the 21st century, and the system is compatible with the 21st century abundance. Thank you. Help!